Father, we are so grateful for these things. Our gratitude is, partially it's overwhelming to me that you have called us and equipped us to come alongside where the wild olive branch <laughs> and to come alongside your people. And it gives us great satisfaction spiritually and understanding to know that these things are happening, that take our place and we praise you for it. For the knowledge years and years and years ago that it was the key that opened the door when we realized that we are in covenant with you by blood and we are blood kin to every Jew. We are blood kin to every believer on the planet and we praise you and thank you for it. My, my, my. Let's just praise him for a moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, our dear Father. Praise you and bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Open your Bibles first today to Matthew chapter 4. This is a bit different from well let me put it this way. This is the first time I've ever done this in a partner meeting. But you'll, uh, you'll see why. Fourth chapter of Matthew. Then was Jesus led up, led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was after hunger. 40 days and 40 nights, that's six weeks. That means starvation had begun. That means when he came out of there, he was very drawn looking. He fasted for six weeks. The tempter came to him and said, if you be the son of God, command the stone to be made bread. Boy, what a dog. But listen, he answered and said, it is written. Deuteronomy 8, 3. It is written. It is written. It is written. This is huge. It is written. And we have it to read. <laughs> it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Amen. We have every word. I was in my car one day and I said, Lord, you spoke to Moses face to face. And I, I, and I, he rose up on the inside of me. He said, well, son, you have everything I said to Moses. He said, I didn't say anything to him that's not in the book. He said, you have everything I said to every prophet. You have everything I said to everybody. God. And you have the entire book. They didn't. God. I began to weep. I pulled my car off the side of the road and just wept when I realized what this, what this really is. This is every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now we go over 
to Romans chapter 10. For Moses describeth righteousness which is of the law, that the man which does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Descend into the deep. That is to, to bring up Christ again from the dead. What does it say? The word is nigh thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that if you shall confess with your mouth Jesus, the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not heard? Whom they have not believed. They can't. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? They can't. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? That's twofold meaning. The anointing is, is, has to be there. But we have to be sent. I have to be sent. I have to be where the Lord wants me to be. And I could be anywhere in the world today, but anywhere else but here, I would be in gross disobedience. Now I've had all that I'm going to have. <laughs> they have to be sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel, the good news of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed our gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and that is my job. Amen. 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 I thought I was an evangelist. And as I said last night, I had those papers all drawn up. But now this was 19, it was 1967, as I said, in, in Tulsa, when this ministry began. And uh, 1977 camp meeting in Tulsa. Now, the meeting we had in uh, in, in the panhandle of Texas, in Hereford, Texas. And that's, that's where the, uh, the Hereford cattle that were bred in England came from Hereford, England. And the only rancher anywhere around. Nobody wanted that bull. And uh, they bred them so that they didn't have any horns. And they, people didn't like that. And the only rancher that would have anything to do with it was a Scotsman. And he took it. And it started right there. And so it's Hereford, Texas. <laughs> I had a three-week meeting there. And I was praying and... That prophet's ministry came across my heart and mind. I said, Lord, now I'm not going to go announce that I'm a prophet. I'm not about to do that. I'm going to leave that up to you. And I want you to do it in a way that 
I don't have to do it. You can do that. I said, I believe I received that, but you just take care of it. And I, I, and I, I don't remember the course, the exact words I said, but I said, I want you to do it. And I want you to do it in front of enough people where I don't. <laughs> anyway. So camp meeting, 1977. Now, see, see if you can just, see if you can just hear this. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it right there. Now, Brother Hagen had already started giving the invitation. It's the Saturday night meeting of camp meeting. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I understand that. I understand that. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell him. Yeah. Ken Copeland. Now, I, have, I, I was a speaker during that meeting and I was up on the platform. I was right behind him. And I heard it in my spirit, get on your knees. I said, Lord, I don't want to get on my knees and draw attention. He said, get on your knees. My knees touched that floor. And he said, Ken Copeland. I said, oh God. <laughs> You're going to have to stir yourself up now. You're going to have to move over there into that healing ministry a little faster than you thought you would. Because you see, the time is short. There was a time you could wait and sort of get ready for some things. You're not jumping out ahead of God. You're keeping step with God. And you're going to have to put some more emphasis in some of these things, which you know to do so, particularly in the area of the healing ministry. Yeah, yeah, I understand that, Lord. And whether you want to or not, you're going to operate in the ministry of the prophet, the seer the seer standing right in the pulpit. You will see it right in front of your eyes, just like you saw it run off on a television screen. You'll be able to minister to the people. Now you're going to get a lot of persecution from, from some, from people, from, some friends. Some are going to draw back from you, but those fair weather friends are not worth it. Go on with God. Jesus is coming. It's better to see, stand in his presence and say, I've not been disobedient. Hallelujah to Jesus. And now I separate you by the direction of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority invested in me as a prophet of God. I separate you under the call of God. And now the anointing of God's power and spirit comes upon you. And by faith, we impart unto you by the direction of the church, who is the head of him who is head of the church the power, the gifts, the endowment, the endowment that's necessary to equip you to stand in that office. Though you start at the bottom of the ladder as you climb upward, upward, ever upward, that ministry shall grow and grow and grow and men shall come to know and many who sat in darkness shall rejoice because they shall see the light and a blessing unto many shall you be. And in that day, many, many more shall rise up and call thee blessed, and thou shalt have cause for much rejoicing. Amen. Well, <laughs> and I was just completely caught off guard by surprise. I went back to the hotel that night. I was just praying as I, as I started to go to sleep, and the Lord said, how did I do? <laughs> I said, you did good. There were 9,000 people in that place. <laughs> he said, how'd I do? And notice how he put it, whether you want to or not. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, then I didn't know what to do next. <laughs> and I, I started to try to reconcile it. And the Lord said, no, don't do that. He said, study the prophets. And he said, listen very carefully, Brother Hagin, because he said, I taught him a New Testament prophet and how they function. And so he said, you continue to teach. But he said, always teach with one hand on love and the other. <laughs> Esteke, 
Okopopo she she stung ang graklikikete. There is no way any human being on the earth can establish a ministry for himself, call himself into it, and then announce that's what he is. From that come false prophets. From that come false preachers. I am the one, saith the Lord, that was appointed by the Father to bring gifts, ministering gifts to the church for the establishing of that. So, son of man, open your Bible to the book of Ephesians and point that out. Yes, sir, I will. So let's just do that right now. Let's go over there to the book of Ephesians. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, which has three parts. You know that. The scripture says we're baptized into the body of Christ and it commands to be baptized in water. And then the baptism of the Holy Ghost is available. Amen. And every believer ought to have that. that, That's the gateway to the supernatural. One God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, led captivity captive, he gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but the first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fulfill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why, Lord? For the perfecting of the saints. for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Well, what is that? The edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. How long? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and His anointing. Glory to God that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, not what the preacher supplies. But faith comes... (laughs) Amen. According to the effectual working of the measure of every part maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind and having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness, that you have not so learned Christ, if so that you have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, you do it, you put off concerning the former manner of life, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on, you put it up, you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, put away lying. 
These were born again, Holy Ghost baptized people. Stop lying. Yeah. If you told somebody you're going to be there at 10, don't go dragging in there at 1130. Yeah, but don't. I just work here. <laughs> but this is my job because there's been a number of times he got on my toes, so I'm going to get on yours. Put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. We're members of one of another. Be ye angry, sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole, now, this is huge right here. Let him that stole steal no more, rather let him labor working with his hands. So hey, I have a living and shoes for the baby and, uh, no. That he may have to give to him that needs. Now that right there, that statement brings us all to this place. You remember what Cain said to God? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Yes. We need to be in the place where we are standing on his word concerning financial prosperity and the fact we've been redeemed from the curse of poverty and, and believe God for more than enough. Yes. After all, he's, he's the El Shaddai God. Yes, yes. So we have more for those that need it. Praise God. Amen. And that's the reason that, and I've observed this over a lot of years. That's the reason there is such high persecution against ministries that have more than enough. We had a very large airplane put into our hands and, um, and it, it looked like it was a whole lot more money than, than but the way we came into it was uh, the, the man that was Tommy Mercer, he, he was, anyway, I eventually had to, the honor and privilege of uh, leading him to the Lord. And he had a Vickers Viscount, which in 19, it was built in 1954 as a British airliner. And he said, Kenneth, I'd give that airplane to you, but he said, I still owe $75,000 on it. Well, so, you know, but the airplane needed to be gone through and we were having it painted. And the man that was painting it and, and I went over there to see it, and he was doing a beautiful job. And uh, he kept telling some off-colored jokes just going on. And uh, the, the man said, this, this is the owner of the airplane. Ah, oh, he came over there and great. What do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. All of a sudden, he became very spiritual. <laughs> Don't you know this airplane could have been sold and the money given to the poor? I said, how much you give to the poor last year? <laughs> See, in his mind, in his eyes, this thing is millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. It is 75000 Yeah. <laughs> But the man that had it originally, it was millions of dollars. Yes, yes. And that became this, this ministry's airplane. And we, we flew it Praise for a God. while. Praise God. But that's the point. Yeah. 
And that happens a lot. So, and it was funny, with one trip, uh, we had everybody on the airplane. We were stocked with Perrier and, and stuff on the airplane. And we got off. And Gloria's brother, Doug, was, uh, he was, back in those days, he was CEO of the ministry. And, and so he was on that trip. And we came down and, and this young man that was uh, the lineman there, he's, he's young, you know, black, well, he's just a young boy, really. And he said, uh, you, uh, did you tell me that a ministry owns this airplane? And Doug said, yeah. He said, well, what's in them little green bottles? <laughs> he won't know what's in those little green bottles. So Doug just got him one. He said, oh, this is good. But everybody wants, that's the reason it is so vitally important that your testimony is pure. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. 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 That, you, that you do things decently and in order. Amen. So, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth that that which is good, good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. All of this is to ministry. Edifying the body of Christ. Whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, for the sake of the anointing. Every time you see that, you go into that, you just stop and translate. Christ was the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Yeah. They both mean the same thing. The anointed one. All of Judaism was looking for the coming of the anointed one. So, then you come to that fifth chapter, be ye followers. That follower word is imitate, M-I-M-E-T-E-H. Be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. That describes the job of the New Testament ministry. And it is extremely important. It, um, well, so now. Let's go. So, so this is the anointing exchange. But it doesn't do anything unless you as a partner take advantage of it. It's just like anything else in the Word of God. Uh, if you don't take advantage of it in the Spirit, possibly you don't know how to take advantage of it. But then that's where these meetings come in. Yeah. That because the body of Christ is a body. Yeah. Well, that's what he's talking about here. And he's talking to the body, yeah. writing a letter to the body. Yeah. And uh, so he founded this church. He, Aquila and Priscilla, founded this church in Ephesus. And... Uh, so then, and now he's writing a letter back to them. And he had to go in there and take care of some things that uh, needed to bring it back in line and explain to them what ministry is and what a calling is and their job, their job right there in Ephesus. Well, it's good for them. It's good for the people in Sacramento. How many of you live here in the city? Uh, have you been interested enough to check out the name of the city? Come on, yes. Come on. Sacramento. 
sacrament. It was founded and called that on purpose. And you go back to the Latin root, it means sacred oath. That's good stuff. <laughs> Amen. There's a lot of difference in that and Fort Worth. <laughs> we were an outpost. There are, there are a number of forts that came down across that part of the country. And um, right where you can just, you just go a little north and west of there, up towards Wichita Falls, and you have Quanah, Texas, Quanah Parker, Comanche War Chief. How many of you saw the movie, The Searchers, the John Wayne? They changed all the names. But that was the story of Cynthia Parker. As a, as a young girl, she was taken by a Comanche war chief. And uh, then she became uh, his wife. And Quanah, and there's Quanah, Texas. And Quanah Parker, not only strong, but a Christian. And spoke absolute perfect English. Went to Washington, D.C. And he was responsible for peace between the, the United States government and the, the Comanche tribes. And that was right there at Fort Worth. And so, and Fort Worth was part of the, the command post that came down across there. So anyway, it's nowhere near as good as Sacramento. <laughs> you know, Santa Fe, New Mexico and the Santa Fe Railroad? That's holy faith. Santa is holy. And in Spanish, fe is faith. Yo predico en fe. I preach in faith. So all of these things were designed by the Spirit of God so that this country from border to border, yes. ocean to ocean, yes. would have a presence of God in it. Yes. And names mean things because of the heart of the people that named it in the first place. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Now then, let's go to 1 Samuel. Now, the first partner meeting I was ever in, when, uh, and I was the driver in those days, and I, I learned so much just driving his car. I mean, he just stopped and they say things to me. And, um, and this is the message I heard from 1 Samuel chapter 30, if you'll turn there with me. It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein and slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives, their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. David's wives were taken captive and David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Oh, we could stop right there and preach the rest of the service. He encouraged, I mean, they're ready to stone him. Come on, he didn't burn it down. 
he, uh, they, he would, after, after he preached, and I was under the anointing, he, he would come at they, we had a little table about so big, it was round, and they, they would put a little black curtain there, and he would come from the platform having, having given an invitation and prayed over the people that came. And then Brother DeWeese would take them then to another area and they would be counseled and they would be given follow-up material. And then and they had, we had church pastors Upon the responsoring. So they would be given the names of those churches and, and if there were some place where they out, out of the city or even out of the country, then the ministry was responsible for helping them find a church and uh, particularly one that would keep you well. And so a strong follow-up. And then he would, he would stop there and he had all of his partners on microfish. Now, some of you younger ones don't know what microfish <laughs> was or is. Microfish was long before computers. And you would take the, the newspaper industry used it to, to file all of their papers. They would photograph it and then reduce it to uh, film microfish down to where he had all the names of his partners on those microfish. Well, we don't do that today. So you're all in here. <laughs> so I just carry you around my pocket. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And this is a solid gold. South, Af South African cougar ran. Oh, nice. It was a very, very special gift to me. Mm. And I thought about putting a, a U.S. $20 gold piece in there, but no, uh, this was a, so very special to me. Mm -hmm. And your names are in there. Mm -hmm. oh, God. God. Now, it's time to update this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the ones of you that become partners today, you'll get in here. <laughs> but I have your picture in my study. Mm -hmm. Great big. Your picture is about that side and it just floats through my study. Yeah. Now my study is divided in two. I have a planning room there where I can plan a, 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 a flight and a desk and that big TV monitor and you just float through my office. <laughs> and I just walk up there and look at you and pat you on the face. And, <laughs> and I mean, you, yeah, there it is. See? <laughs> oh, you have no idea how we love you. Now, David inquired at the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this truth? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, listen to what, without fail, you will recover all. Amen. Now, if he just launched out on that journey, just, well, oh, Lord, I don't know whether we're going to do any good or not. Oh, they're probably all dead by now. See, we know they weren't killed, but they didn't know it. So, so David went and the 600 men that were with him and they came to the brook or the river be sore. Those that were left behind stayed. David pursued and 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so faint they could not go over the brook before. And they found an Egyptian in the field. They found an Egyptian in the field. <laughs> 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 
and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. And they made him drink water and gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again into him. He had eaten no bread nor drunk any water for three days and three nights. David said to him, who do you belong to? He said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days ago and I fell sick. He made an invasion upon the south and upon the coast that belonged to Judah and upon the south of Caleb and, and burnt, burnt, burned Ziklag with fire. David said to him, can you bring me down to this company? He said, swear unto me by God, you will neither kill me nor deliver me back to that man. I won't go on with him. I will bring you down to, the, to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. David smote them from twilight even unto the evening of the next day. Now, how many of you here have been in the military? They were on a forced march. They were, they were driving hard to catch up with them. And look what happened. David smote them from twilight evening until the evening of the next day. He fought them all night long after a forced march. Dear Lord. Now, I, I was in the army during peacetime. I was never on a forced march. But I know what a 24 mile march is with full pack out in the desert, in the white sand desert, New Mexico. And, uh, but you can see it in World War II. My father-in-law was in it. Wallace Raymond, Babe Niece. Outstanding baseball player and everybody called him Babe. I have a picture, well, uh, uh, I took a picture of it in my phone, of his separation papers. He attained the rank uh, of sergeant, actually sergeant major, because we have a picture of him with, with uh, six rockers with a diamond in the middle. So he is sergeant major. Yeah, there it is. Very much of a man. And uh, it lists the Battle of the Rhine and the Battle of the Ardennes which was the Battle of the Bulge. So he was with Patton. That was a forced march. And they said he couldn't do it. General Patton said, yes, we will do it. I trained these men. So he trained my father-in-law. It was the coldest winter in 50 years. And they didn't have any cold weather gear. They picked up and they forced march into Belgium, into the Ardennes, which was a dense forest. Then the Battle of the Rhine. And he came home with considerable PTSD. Of course, back then, we never heard of it. I didn't know what it was. <clears throat> but anyway, he... Uh, He's just quite a man. I, anyway, he had a, a severe heart attack and uh, had to do a bypass surgery on him. And of course, he was raised in the Church of Christ. And, uh, well, I'll tell you, his mother knew God. <laughs> anyway, we went over there in Texarkana. And the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Nashville, Arkansas, stayed with him night and day, slept in the room with him. 
And he said, Copeland, I uh, just stayed with him night and day. And he said, when he was in recovery and, and doing well, he said, I made absolutely sure that he's born again. And he never took another drink. But now see, he'd, he'd, get, he'd get back into those battles. And the World War II guys never talked about it. But then he would, and he'd do things that he didn't even know that he did. But he was just a sweet man. And he introduced me to my wife. So <laughs> he's the one that, at that party. He said, my daughter's the best looking girl in the state of Arkansas. <laughs> And anyway, so this is important. And I, I want, but I wanted you to see here what these men were up against. And they didn't have the kind of equipment and so forth that we have now and the ability to do that. So it had to be the power of God altogether. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. He rescued his two wives. There, there was no... Nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons or daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. He took all the flocks and the herds which they drove before the cattle. This is David's spoil. David came to the 200 men which were so faint they could not follow David. <laughs> Stayed abide at the brook Besor, and they, they went forth to meet David, to meet the people that were with him. When David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men, the men of Bilal, of those that went with David, and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them all of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man, his wife, his children. They may lead them away and depart. Then David said, you shall not do so, my brethren, that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand for who will hearken unto you in this matter. But as his part that goes down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarries by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward and made a statute and an ordinance in Israel until this day. Now let's take a look at that brook. This, that's it right there. Now that's when it's dry. But still, they had their quartermaster with them. They had all those cattle. They, they had everything, everything there. And they would have to herd that bunch of stuff down in there. Now look at it after a rain. Brook. <laughs> and right there, it's a raging torrent. So there's no way. And here's a bunch, here's a bunch of ungodly men that's going to... And... It's the same men that ate that food that these men stayed behind and took care of and then lose them in that mess there and go down and fight. The reason they were so faint, I mean, they're herding all that cattle. That's slow and hard work to keep up with a herd of cattle to feed an army. 600 men. David said, no, no. They, they stood by and kept this, kept, took care of our, yeah. all of our quartermaster. They're part of this team. Yes. And their spoil yeah. is equal yeah. to all of ours. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And that ordinance, and I heard Oral Roberts preach that. And I, tell, I got so excited. And then he began to talk about the anointing. Mm. Yes, sir. He said, we're in this together. Yeah. And he said, you're my partners. And all of those that, you would, that would like to be a partner. 
He said $10 a month, $125 a year. And at the end of the year, if you haven't received that and more than that, you let me know, I'll give you money back. So it had a money back guarantee. <laughs> but he said, we're in this together. So my anointing is available to you. Whether you're a school teacher or whatever God has called you to do. And there's no such thing as a Christian without a calling. The problem is so many of them don't inquire long enough to find out what it is and just go about their merry way. And um, I heard Andrew Womack say this and he said it shocks a lot of people. But if you're a born again, even spirit filled Christian, but that's it. You just go about your merry way. You have missed. You have missed the greatest part of your Christian life. You've missed it. Ah, Brother Wama, what do you mean? Well, how do you know where you're, you're where you're supposed to be? You just follow the money. Most Christians mm -hmm. yep. have a good church, children in good school. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you're going to get a hundred dollar month raise and it's off over there somewhere else. Oh, let's pack up and go. Mm -hmm. yes. Dear Lord, yeah. Yeah. did you pray about it? Well, no, but look, God, God has provided me a better job. Mm -hmm. How do you know? That's right. That's right. Amen. <laughs> and that's the problem. Yep. A great, great problem and not understanding the power of this book, that this is just as much a manifestation of God in the earth as Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because it is written. <laughs> it is written. And we fight the same fight. I heard the Lord say to me one day, let my word fight its own fight. You fight with it, just like I did. You overcome with it, just like I did. It is the sword of the Spirit. Praise God. Amen. So now, Luke chapter 4. Glory to God. Oh. Mm -mm -mm. When the devil had ended all, this is a fourth chapter of Luke, and we'll uh, read that 12th verse. Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is said. <laughs> Where did it say that? Deuteronomy 6.16. And the devil had ended all temptation. He departed for a season. I don't blame him. <laughs> See, now the devil knew by this time and over the years he killed prophets because of the curse that was put on him in the garden. And so he just kept killing prophets thinking that maybe this is the one. He did just make up some way where they kill the prophet. Well, they were in such habit of killing the prophets, they decided they're going to kill this one. Well, now this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now the devil knows who it is. But the spirit drove him out into the wilderness and put him out there on his own except for the God within him. Why do you do that? Because the preaching anointing had come on him in that water baptism. The Levitical age of 30. Yes. Now he's ready for ministry. Yes. When Joseph yes. was in Egypt and 
the man for whom he interpreted a dream forgot him for two years, yeah, yeah. but he wasn't but 28. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. And when he was 30, yes. Pharaoh called for him. Yes. And the scripture says he got cleaned up. Yes. Went in there at 30 years old, became prime minister of the most powerful nation on the earth at that time. What a book. <laughs> what a God. <laughs> that timing. Micah said a baby would be born in Bethlehem. That word managed nations, governments, armies. It came to pass 715 years later. And at that moment, taxation was declared. And so they had to go to Bethlehem. <laughs> right on time. Because it had been said. So what is the first covenant and who were the prophets? God gave the prophets words to give to the people to say. That was their job. That's what they did. And they got killed for it. <laughs> but now in the second covenant, Jesus taught faith. Yes. He taught all these things. And we have the benefit of the second covenant in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. So, but notice how it works. And now the master himself, he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. Now, Nazareth was a village, wasn't a city. It had never did have over 150 people in it. That's the reason one of the disciples said, could anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, it's just a little town, a bunch of grappy people that just, you know, just bunch of knotheads. <laughs> I don't think they stayed there. And he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. But he went on about their cities and villages teaching. So I don't think they stayed that way. And because of the teaching. And he did lay his hands on, a, on some people. Because this is his hometown. He knew everybody there. A few minor ailments. But they did get healed. Mm -hmm. And they had a testimony. Mm -hmm. And Sonny Boy did it. <laughs> so, yeah. amen. amen. So now then the power of the testimony. He found the place where it is written. He found it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Now, in that synagogue, in, 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 in synagogues, there is a, 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 a seat that is up like this. You walk in the synagogue, at least in the ones that I've been in. You walk in there and there's a large chair here for the priest, but then there's a podium standing right in front of him. And there are chairs on each side. And you, you walk up there and you take the scroll. Well, he didn't follow the Sabbath reading. He opened it to the book of Isaiah, what you and I know is the 61st chapter. And he began to read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to preach recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised 
and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord or the great Jubilee. And that is supernatural. Hang on here a minute. This thing honks at me. Good, that means time for me to stop. He closed the book, gave it to the minister and sat down. The eyes of all them in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began to say, so we just have the, the synopsis of his message. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now they were getting along good until he said that. He could have said, well, oh, there's coming one like Moses. They'd have shouted amen. <laughs> and one of these days, but he said today. Ugh. He closed the book and gave it to the minister and set down the eyes of all of them in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began to say, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said unto them, you will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever you've heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were, were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and great famine was through all the land. But, but none of them, he had sent and to disrupt a city of Sidon unto a woman that was a widow. Many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elisha, the prophet. None of them were cleansed except Naaman. I mean, that's serious indictment. Not an Israelite healed in the whole land. Here's Naaman, or Naaman is it really the way you pronounce his name. A Syrian leper. <laughs> they got furious over that. He just laid it out. They all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the bow of the hill where the city was built that they might cast him down headlong, but he passing through the midst of them went his way. He came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath day, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man with an unclean spirit and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Are you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold your peace and come out of him. And then the devil threw him in the midst. He came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spoke this anointing. It's the anointing working, see, in his words. The anointing in his words. What word is this? For authority and power he commandeth unclean spirits and they come out. Fame of him went out unto every place of the country round about. He arose out of that synagogue and entered into Simon's house. Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever and they besought him for her. He stood over her, rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she rose and ministered unto them. Oh, praise God. His words. His words are with power. Huh. He, he now, he was just as much the son of God when he was 29 as when he was 30. And he said, my time has come. Went to Cana, went to a wedding. And they ran out of wine. Well, you know the story. She came to him and said, they're out of wine. He said, well, what does that have to do with me? <laughs> because he only said what his father said and only did what he saw his father do. But his mother said <laughs> to the servants, whatever he says to you, do, do it. So mama got him into this thing. <laughs> 
but it was the first miracle you performed. Amen. That water became wine. He's providing everywhere he went. Yes. He provided. And that anointing was so powerful and so strong. So now, Luke 8. And it came to pass afterward, he went out through every city, village, preaching and showing glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him. Certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, I mean, she is right up front. Mary, mm -hmm. called Magdalene, that was because she was from Magdal. That's not her last name. We get to heaven, we're going to find out her last name. And the woman with the issue of blood. Sweetheart, you helped me all these years and I still don't know your name. <laughs> Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Howard, Herod's steward, Susanna, many others which ministered unto him of their substance. Three prominent women traveled with him as a team. And many others which ministered unto him of their substance. What was happening? His partners were traveling with him. <laughs> They were traveling with him. Yes. And what, whatever was happening, well, you and I both know the power of increase around him. Yes. <laughs> yes. We read it last night. Yes. That young man just walked away grieved because he had many possessions. And Jesus only pointed out the commandments which he had kept from his youth. Yeah. So he, he, he didn't judge him. Mm -hmm. Amen. And he loved him. He called him. But he wasn't there. He didn't hear the calling. That's sad. So, but now here, and then he preached again on the sower went out to sow. So the word of God is a seed. Now then, let's go back to Isaiah 10. Look at the 27th verse and it shall come to pass in that day. Well, this is the day that his burden shall be taken off of your shoulder, his yoke from off your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Destroyed. Some people say, well, the anointing breaks the yoke. No, it doesn't. It destroys it. Because of the anointing. One translation says because of the oil. And another says because of the fatness. Yes. Well, what's that? That is talking about the anointing oil because that's what it was in the first covenant. The anointing oil. And the anointing was on the king and the priest, amen, the Holy Spirit, was, the general population didn't have that. Right. And they, the king and the priest and the prophet. Yes. Well, it's the same in the, the second covenant too. Because we are a holy priesthood. Yes. <laughs> yes. And he is the king of kings. kings. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the apostle Paul said, all of you, all of you can prophesy. Yep. Not all prophets, but all of you can yep. prophesy. Exactly. Yep. Praise God. Amen. So these things have come to pass. And in, in one, it says, because of the fatness of the neck. 
The yoke just can't do it there. But it is the anointing. And the Lord gave me this, this phrase. It is the burden removing, yoke destroying power of the living God that dwells on the inside of us. Amen. Now, I want, we won't turn to this. You, you can find it over in 2 Kings. The bones of Elisha. Now that night, that Saturday night in 1977, we were, uh, the, the speaker's glory was right here the next to me. And he was, he was sitting then right here at the end of us. And so it would be like where I was sitting here and he would have been sitting right here, along about right here. And he was just sitting there. He was in a, he was in a better chair than we were in. But he was just leaned back, leaned back there. And, and he got up and he said, well, I don't know what I'm going to say about this, but uh, uh, I, say, I just keep hearing the bones of Elisha, the bones of Elisha, the bones of Elisha. So he preached on the prophet's anointing <laughs> that whole evening about the bones of Elisha. And you know the story. I mean, Elisha, uh, they, they, they were taking a young man that had died and to, to bury him. Well, here came the enemy over the hill and they didn't take time to bury him. They just threw him in there and he landed on the bones of Elisha and there was so much power in that dead prophet's bone it raised him from the dead and he ran off. Amen. <laughs> well, I was thoroughly enjoying this and he's teaching on the anointing of the prophet. He was in a meeting and uh, this was when tape recorders became very popular. And so, and all of us used to do this. We'd take our own recorders and hook up, you know. So, and that's what happened here in this meeting. I think it was in El Paso. Anyway, he got excited on the platform. And, and he, he jumped down and he was about to land on this <laughs> tape recorder. And so he, he, he dodged that and fell and, and landed on his elbow. And he, he knew he really hurt his elbow. But he finished his message. And there was a nurse in the, in the congregation. So she got in the car and they ran, took him to the hospital. He got in there and the doctor looked at him and he said, Well, your arm's not broken, Brother Hagin said. Oh, he said, Well, now wait a minute. Reverend, he said, this is probably worse. He said, you, you've pushed it completely out of place. He said, now I can put it back, but he said, I'm going to have to put you under. And, uh, and he said, now, you'll, you'll not be able to do this. And he said, he said I'm going to keep you in the hospital here for, for a while of our observation. So he was in that hospital and he was sitting up in the bed. Aretha had just gone. And he was just sitting there and he heard the, some steps coming down the hall. He said the door was ajar four, five, six inches. And it sounded like he's coming into his room and said he looked over there and uh, there's a pair of Roman sandals came through the door. He looked up and it was Jesus. Wow. Well, he said, you know, whoa. And he said, he talked to me for an hour and a half about the prophet's ministry. And he said, now, he, he said, uh, uh, I could just heal you right now, but I'm not going to do it. He said, you have 
you've been saying you're a teacher and a prophet. No, he said, you're a prophet and a teacher. Now he said, everything's going to be all right. I'm going to take care of it. But he said, you're seeing me and, and I'm talking to you. But he said, I'm not going to lead you this way anymore. You're going to have to go by the inward witness. So <laughs> then he was supposed to come back and see the doctor at a certain time. And he did after it healed up. And, uh, and that's when he told him, well, you'll never be. He said, what, this? <laughs> and the doctor was astounded. And that's when he learned the ins and the outs of the prophet's ministry. And that's what he began to teach all of us and how it worked and what our responsibilities are. Praise God. So I had the, the distinct advantage of learning from him. But now, verse 10, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people and the Gentiles seek in the root. Rush shall be glorious. Now look here. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord and shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. So it was said, it was established. Now it had to happen. That he had to be anointed. He had to be of age. All of that had to come to pass. And it did, as you and I know. So now, let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints be in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you remember what happened here before. An earthquake. Remember that? And um, nowhere but there. Philippi was a small Roman garrison town the Roman army was, was garrisoned there. And uh, this was a prison there. And they kept political prisoners there. And there was a dungeon in that prison that was below the rest of the prison where just regular inmates. And I, you know, in my mind, after having come out of the army, I mean, it, just, it seemed to me that this was probably a stockade and Roman soldiers had gotten in trouble. They'd go to jail, but then they had a dungeon for political prisoners. And that's where the apostle was. So and that earthquake took place and that jailer that took him in, took them in and cleaned them up and got saved is now the pastor of this church. So this is a convict church <laughs> by and large. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine. Now, this happens with you and with me personally. Uh, I pray over you every meal Every meal, every time, every, every, every time I eat, I don't care where I am, three or four times a day, I pray over you every meal. I pray over you in my shower. So if you ever feel like your head gets wet, well, <laughs> and I call out the scriptures that I write on that letter. Amen. And then, of course, at night, in the, uh, over the monitors. 
I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge and in the judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent. You, you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with all the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ and to every glory and praise of God. Verse, 17th verse, the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel and went with extending in every way. Verse 19, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and through your supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, and so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Whether it be by life or death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Now this is a letter. He didn't write it as fast as I'm reading it. The letter that I write, I get up on that morning, on the 20th of each month, or around that, whichever way the calendar falls. But that 20th of the month is sacred to me. I get up, have breakfast. I don't even get dressed. I'm still in my pajamas and robe. <laughs> and I go into my study and close the door and begin to pray in the spirit. And generally, some difference of, of course, sometimes I'll pick up that, that letter before I ever get in there. But like this last one was for May. And I had... I had several ideas, so, but I just prayed in the spirit and, and I said, now, what do, you, what do you want to say to my partners? I opened my heart and I opened my mind. So I just started with a salutation. And here it came. <laughs> well, I was in there by about 15 after nine. I finished it up, took the handwritten copy and put it in an, an inner ministry mailer, called Ashley, my uh, assistant, told her where it was and have somebody come pick it up. And by the time I get through with that, it's right about 12, 30, 1 o'clock. So it takes all morning. And this is a very unusual thing, but I, I have had it a, a few times, not many, where it came in pieces and maybe, maybe lasted over a couple of days, but that's, that's rare. It doesn't usually happen that way. And, uh, but that's usually what it takes. It takes all morning long. And I go back through it and reread it and, and make corrections on it and, and so forth. And, uh, and then the editing department gets hold of it and they, they type it out exactly the way I wrote it just on line paper. So I go back over it again. And once I go back over it again, uh, more than a few times, I've gone in and corrected some things. And, and time or two, the Lord said, no, you didn't get that right in the first place. Add this to it. So it's quite a process. And then it comes back to me in a book form. And I go through there and read all of the, everything that will come to you in that envelope. Everything I have, I, okay. Nobody does anything on that letter or that book that I don't see it. And I have to okay that. And there's been times that I've said, no, that isn't what I said. No. <laughs> so I go back. Now, I don't want that. 
I don't want it to do, I don't want that to happen like that. This is quite a process. Then immediately a copy goes to George and he reads it and he goes through it. And, uh, and then the staff reads it and it, there's quite a process and you get prayed for every time, every hand that goes through there. Everybody is praying and believing God for your success. But as partners, you're a vital part of this ministry. The ordinance of David, we share and share alike. So, and I'm a partner with a 700 club. No telling how many people have come to the Lord through that ministry. Our ministry is a partner with a 700 club. I lay hold of that. All of those people that come to the Lord through the 700 cup, there's only heaven knows. Well, hey, sweetheart. <laughs> Out beside glory in my name in heaven, it says that we won all of those people to the Lord. Because the trophy goes to the whole team. <clears throat> Glory to God. I'm still a partner with Oral Roberts Ministry. I'm still a partner with Kenneth Hagin. This message, this book, God, a Covenant and a Contradiction, that's a message Brother Hagin preached. So I started sending that to some people. So I called Ken Jr. I, I just sent it, you know, download. I said, hey, I, I sent this to some people and, uh, and you didn't get any money out of it. <laughs> so I said, I'm sending enough money to cover it. Amen. You don't just pass his material around. Mm-hmm. We were at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. I had a tape table. He had a tape table. And we were both out at our tape tables and somebody else was preaching. And he came over there and looked at my table. He said, Kenneth, at least you should have changed the titles. I said, no, sir, that's the title of it. I wouldn't change that for anything. And I told him right there then, I said, if it was a book, I wouldn't change the title of it. This is the title of that message. And I'm not about to change it. Everybody knows I got it from you. (laughs) Because I told everybody. But this is the correct and right thing to do. That if you're going to send somebody if you're going to download somebody else's material and send it over there, see that that person is remunerated for because that's his property. Well, you don't steal his property just because you can do it online any more than you would break into his house. You just don't do that. So, in that 27th verse, let your manner of life be as becomes the gospel of Christ. And whether I come to see you absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together in the faith of the gospel, nothing terrified by your adversaries. Well, in the second chapter, I believe that he made that decision. I'm going to stay. I believe he made that while he was writing the letter. You need me. I really would like to get out of this place, (laughs) but you need me here. Verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Well, the world hadn't changed. (laughs) It's still a nasty place. But we're in it. 
we're supposed to be doing something about the darkness in this world. Well, thank God for satellites and, and, and all of these marvelous, wonderful things. Hallelujah. And b before I even walked out here, uh, I, I, I knew how many households in their time three now. It used to be the average was times four, but no more. The, the average is three. So the, when I walked out here, I don't know how many have come online since. But when I walked out here, I'm speaking to an audience of 15,000 people. And I used to sit down in that TV studio and look at that camera, just that big hole. And back there then, we didn't know. But oh, we do now. Thank you, Jesus. So, and it was a born again, spirit filled man that put the first one out there and caused it to sink up. That was the problem. Get that thing to sink up. Holy Ghost man did it. Clyde McGee. Yes. Brother Halverson. Of course, back there then, it was super classified. Brother Halverson got in front of him and he said, birds, birds, come out, birds. You know what I'm talking about? Birds. <laughs> he said, oh yeah, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> and Clyde McGee was a good friend. How many of you remember the worldwide communion service that we had? Clyde McGee is the one that hooked those satellites together and it had never been done. And it, the first hooking together of the satellites was for a worldwide communion service. There was Dr. Cho in, in Korea and, other, and there were churches all over the, the country that held it. Did you, your church did that? Yeah. And it came down by satellite in different churches and we all took communion together all over the world. Third chapter, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. This is just four little chapters. Just sit down sometime and read it. It's a letter. Rejoice always again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. He used joy, one form or another, 19 times in this book. And he was in prison when he wrote it. He knew that the joy of the Lord was his strength. Then that 13th verse, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. There was a young man pointed that out to me one day and it was Billy Rash. That fellow right there pointed that out to me. Amen. I can do all things through Christ, which anointing. I can do all things through the anointed one, which strengthens me. Some say, who strengthens me? No. Which strength? It's the anointing. He's referring to the anointing, not just, not just the man. People lose that. There's a lot of people that just have the idea that Christ is Jesus' last name. No, it's what he preached. He's Messiah. Now here it is. Here's the bottom line. I can do all things through the anointed one and his anointing, which strengthens me. Notwithstanding you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. You have a heavenly account. Glory to God. 
I have all and abound. I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an, o an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to you. Now look, look at this. Look how the Spirit of God organized His words. But my God, he could have said, our God. No, this is a partner letter. He said so at the beginning of it. Praise <laughs> God. My God. I'm an apostle. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by the anointing of Jesus the anointed one and his anointing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the way it works. And I'll give you a couple of examples here and we'll pray. Jesus said, if you receive a prophet because he is a prophet, you shall receive a prophet's reward. And, uh, the one that comes to mind so out, it's very outstanding. There was a woman that was standing at a signal light in Dallas. And she stepped off of the curb and twisted her ankle and it just popped like a gun. And she knew she broke her ankle. She couldn't walk. And she said, Lord, I am a I'm a partner with the Copelands and they prayed for me today and I'm healed. Glory to God. And it was healed before she got across the street. She took advantage of what belonged to her. This is what I'm talking about. Oral Roberts had laid hands on so many people that he just literally destroyed his shoulders and had to have surgery several times. And this person came up to me and said, all that healing power going through his shoulders and, and he had to have surgery and like accusing him of not having faith. And it just came out of my mouth. Healing is not a reward. It's a property. It belongs to you. Now what you do with it is what counts. Well, he had an appendicitis attack. And they were looking at taking his appendix out. So he was in the hospital. And Richard and the doctor were behind a the shield there looking. He was kind of like down here. And uh, they were looking at his appendix through an x-ray machine. And he was just laying there and he said, Lord, I have had the final surgery. And he quoted that scripture right there in Philippians. And he said, I'm cashing in on some receipts today <laughs> and I'm not having any more surgery in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I serve. And his appendix started shrinking up. And the doctor said, Richard, do you see that? He said, yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> and his appendix was normal and he got up and left. See, that healing belonged to him. So he cashed a receipt. <laughs> I came back home and uh, that partner service, he passed out that little envelope. It had the uh, little, little pencil in it. And a little envelope for $10. I filled it out. You've heard me tell it. I said, now I'm a partner. $10 a month. So I put the pencil in the envelope. And uh, we, were in, we were in southern Georgia. And 
and I'm, I'm supposed to be driving the car and he's leaving. So I, I got to hustle here. So, and so the usher came by and I stuck that in there and headed out. And I heard, hey, hey, you. <laughs> yeah, you. Now, we're in Georgia, you understand. The, and the, the Lord been aware of what me this whole meeting to give you $10. You know what a worry word is? Yeah. <laughs> you, if you, you, maybe if you don't if you've never had children, but <laughs> I want a drink of water. I don't want to go to bed. Let me out of bed. I need out of here. Oh, no. No, you stay there. No, I don't want to. <laughs> what else, Daddy? What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? Children, Jesus, what? Do? <laughs> That's a worry ward. I said, oh, old lady, thank you. Give it here. And I stuck it in my envelope and put my pencil in my pocket. I'm a partner. Well, I, I tell this everywhere I go in every partner meeting. Just maybe she'll come up to me sometime. Of course, that is a lot of years ago now. She was a black woman, I'm guessing, oh, maybe 40 or so, young woman, and she was in the second row, right about there. I said, oh, lady, give it here. And I took that $10 and put it in. We're partners. So then I need to, I need to tell Gloria. So we got back home and, and, uh, of course, I was always a little later. Bob and I were later than anybody else because we had to put the airplane up and see that everything's done. And so I got home and I said, Gloria, we are partners with Oral Roberts Ministry for $10 a month. She said, Kenneth, where are we ever going to get $10 a month? <laughs> I'm, and I realized she hadn't heard the message. I said, sit down, girl. So, <laughs> and I preached it as close as I could. I took those scripture references, particularly that one and, and, and at Ziklag and all that. <clears throat> and here was the bottom line. I said, Gloria Jean, we can have Oral Roberts anointing for, $12, for $10 a month. Don't you think that's wonderful? <laughs> she said, well, yeah, that's great. And that was at a time when she'd go to the grocery store and pray in the spirit that she didn't have to put anything back. Well, those days are gone forever. I just want you to know where we started. But that partnership, we were there in Palm Springs. He said, get up with me in the morning. And he was sitting at his desk and turned towards me and I was about as far as near to Billy. He said, what is that? I said, well, it's the word of God. What is that? They're letters and they're just as anointed today as they were when it was written. <laughs> that was my introduction to partner letter. <laughs> and I didn't expect it any more than Billy did. <laughs> he hit me in the chest with it. He threw it. He just shoveled past it and hit me hard with it. Are you willing to commit from this day to write your partners a letter every 30 days as long as you live? I said, yes, sir, I am. You write that letter to meet their needs. He said, after you write it, you read over it. And if you had any thought about will they give or not if I say this, tear it up. Well, it happened. I tore them up. But after a while, it took upon itself a format 
And it became so big in my life that it has, well, I don't know, that was a lot of years ago. And we haven't missed a 30 days since. Amen. When they, when that judge convicted Phil Driscoll of something that wasn't against the law until after his trial, he said, well, he's a good man, but we are just going to make an example of him and gave him a year in prison. I had a book, Letters to My Partners. He took that book in with him and he read those letters over and over and over until he wore that book out reading those partners. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you. We give you praise and honor for the privilege of standing in this place and in this office. 